All right, welcome to your free prep hour. We are going to be talking about uh, quant speed strategies as I, we have done a few times before. Other videos are available on YouTube. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about time sets, a um, little bit about how to build and review them. And then we're just gonna model them by, by practicing uh, some time sets. So we'll get in a little bit of everything across, well, maybe not everything, but uh, a little bit of this and that across uh, several different areas of quant. I wanna talk about putting some of this together. If you've um, learned some strategy at this point, learn some rules, uh, try to apply some of that stuff. If you're still on the newer side, a lot of this might just be introducing concepts for the first time and that's okay. Um, and one thing that I think is important as you're um, building and reviewing sets is, is to think about what your goals are and how this fits in. Are you are you just getting reacquainted with a bunch of math you haven't seen in years and you're just sort of seeing what, what you remember and what you don't? Have you been studying really intensively for six months and you're just trying to hit some very um, targeted weak areas? You know, what are, what are you trying to accomplish when you do it? Um, all the problems we're doing today are drawn from our five pound book of GRE practice problems, which you can get if you don't have it. Uh, but we'll be doing some of those today. Um, I'm just going to flash this up if anyone wants to, you know, pause and look at this in more uh, detail later or take a picture of this. Um, these are the speed strategies that I go through in some of the other workshops. And we'll be talking um, about pieces of this um, as we review our work. But the focus is today is really going to be on how do I get through a practice set in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, we'll be doing fairly short practice sets because of the nature of the one hour workshop, um, but you know you might be building longer ones. So let me talk about a few principles for, for building those. First off, length. Um, I think a lot of people tend to lean on longer sets because they know that the GRE is long, although it's uh, you know about to get uh, you know, half the length uh, before, right? After of September 22nd, uh, the GRE is gonna be, you know, more in the two hour than in the four hour range. Um, but people will say, okay, I'm gonna do a, an hour long set or something like that. And I think mostly you can save that for the practice tests. So uh, really commonly I'll have people do practice sets of somewhere in the neighborhood of three to 10 questions. Three, I think is a perfectly reasonable number. You might do a set of five, a set of eight or 10. Um, 10 is a lot, uh, especially if you're reviewing really thoroughly. But this partly depends on what you're trying to do. So another thing I would think about is what kind of set are you trying to do? Um, some people will do practice sets out of the GRE official guide, um, which are meant to be timed sets. Um, until they redo that, the sets will reflect, will actually really reflect the old paper test. And so they're meant to be longer sets um, of one type than you're gonna than you're gonna see in a section of the GRE now. But you can still use those as a full-time set just to get some mixed practice. But there's only a few of those. So more typically we'll be pulling uh, problems from other sources, whether it's from our five pound book or any other um, you know test material that you have or things from another vendor. Um, a lot of my students do mixed sets. They do a bit of this and that. And I think that's valuable. But sometimes it's really important to, to do targeted sets too, to say, hey, I, you know, I want to get better at exponents and roots. And rather than just review the rules endlessly, um, I'm going to do you know, five exponents and roots problems and do those timed and then review and look at the kind of patterns I see in those problems. If I already know my rules for exponents and roots, you know, what sorts of trouble still crop up? What kind of things do I still, you know, do wrong or need to get more uh, fluent and efficient? And, and then are there rules or concepts I need to memorize? We want to see those differently. There's one thing to say like, hey, I don't remember the Pythagorean theorem or, you know, I don't know how to factor a quadratic equation. It's another thing to say, hey, I knew how to do all the things, but I had trouble actually doing them, right? Uh, and that's going to affect, you know, what your goals are coming out of the, the time set as well. Um, Allocate a realistic amount of time for your set. Um, on average, you're going to have about a minute and three quarters uh, per quant question on the GRE. Um, we'll often tell people to lean towards the 120 side for um, quantitative comparison, the two column ones, uh, and then two minutes for everything else, um, whether that's the data interpretation that comes in sets of three, um, whether that's the uh, you know, just standard uh, you know, A3 multiple choice or choose all that apply or fill in the blank. Um, so that's what I'll do today. I'll just allocate for your sets two minutes uh, per problem, unless there's a quant comp, which there are a few of that will be a minute 20. Um, and you know, you want to look for chances in a set to apply the strategies that you learned. Sometimes you have a very specific goal, like you're looking for ways to estimate. A really, uh, really valuable goal, I think, is to look at problems, whether you're seeing them for the first time or whether you're reviewing them and say, are there any answers that are definitely wrong? Right? We've got other workshops where we talk about this. Are there answers that are definitely wrong? Are there expectations I should have about what traits the answer should have, whether it's how big or small the number I want? Um, certain properties it has to have. Maybe it needs to be even or negative or a fraction or you know whatever that is. Um, 
are there reasons that certain numbers just couldn't work or couldn't be the answer, right? Um, you also want to think about really, really crucially um, within a set that you want to normalize moving on. I will tell you, I am good at the GRE. I don't think it's bragging. I'm, you're, you know, you're here because I'm a teacher. I'm, I'm good at the GRE and I still have to skip things and come back to them. And, you know, if you, if you, you know, really dominate the test, you might skip things and come back to them and still come back and get them all right. And that's great, but still move on. Um, sometimes I just get stuck. I was doing a practice test the other day and there was a really interesting sort of theoretical question that I didn't see a way to do. And I was like, oh, this could be a stumper. And I could totally imagine myself spending five minutes on it, um, which is what a lot of my students do. They'll spend five minutes on something. Maybe they'll finally have a breakthrough or maybe they'll still be stuck after five minutes, but they're just going in circles. So break that and, and, and move on. Don't save that for practice tests. If you only practice timing and if you only practice letting things go on practice tests, you won't have enough practice with that by the time you take the real GRE. It is one of like the top three things that people need to master, I would say, um, is getting used to the time requirements and getting used to letting things go and do that early. Don't say, well, I worked on it for two minutes, but then I realized I'm, I feel so proud of myself. I realized that it wasn't good. And I let go. If you're going to let it go and you know, you'd look back and say, at what point did I know that? And if that point was 15 seconds in 20 seconds in, then don't spend two minutes on it in the first place. And then review with a purpose. Make sure that you're reviewing with an eye toward what do you actually want to get out of this and what do you need for next time. So a couple, a couple things there, and we'll try to model some of this today. Um, one is your review focus can match the intention behind the set. If you were doing a mix set where your main idea was, did I recognize what I need to recognize in here? Are there any, you know, missing pieces I need to fill in? Then, you know, push the idea of recognition uh, in your review. How quickly did I recognize what kind of problem this was? Um, if you're focusing very heavily on which ones to do and which ones to let go, then make sure that's a really strong focus of your review. Um, look back and say, was this one I should have done and why? And sometimes I think my students think I'm rude when I tell them it was a mistake for you to try this problem. It was a mistake for you to do it. It could sound kind of like rude or patronizing, like I'm saying, you can't do this. But it's just more a practical thing of if at the time you were getting flustered by it, and if even now reviewing it doesn't make a lot of sense to you, then why did you spend a whole bunch of time trying to do it? At what point should you have said, hey, I'm not seeing this right now, even if I would see it later? I always recommend blind review, which is basically that you review first and check answers later. So you go back and say, hey, I like D. Um, how do I prove it? What other ways are there to go? On verbal, sometimes that means having a clear reason why A and B and C and E are wrong. Um, but it's also, you know, how well could I have predicted this? How confident am I in my answer? Right? These kinds of things. Um, one of the most common things that people don't realize they're, they're having trouble with uh, is, were you clear on what the question wanted for you? In other words, did you know what the question was asking? Were you answering the question that they were asking? And you think people would know whether that was happening or not, but often we're answering something just a click away from what they really asked. And so I think getting used to reviewing for this, how do I know what they really wanted? And was I, was I determining that well? And was I solving for it? Um, often when I have trouble with a problem, um, even if I get it right, it's because the, the question was like a few steps away from what I was solving. So maybe I solved for X, but I had to remember that they want 3X plus 12. Or maybe I solved in centimeters and the answer should be in kilometers or something like that. I had one the other day that I missed because, or I started to miss um, because I didn't do that kind of conversion. And thankfully, the GRE is actually sometimes kinder than we expect. The trap answer that you would have if you didn't do the conversion wasn't there. If it had been, I probably would have picked it and been wrong. But since uh, it wasn't there, that gave me a chance to go, oh, I know what I did wrong. Okay, let me fix that. And uh, But I don't want to rely on that kind of luck. I don't want to hope the GRE will be nice and not put that trap answer there. I don't want to have that trap answer in the first place. So organization uh, is a big part of that. I'm also looking for sort of positives and negatives. What else could I have seen? What things could I have noticed or focused on or... Um, what could I have realized about the problem early that would have made me faster, right? Think of it as like developing your expertise. Um, if you imagine that expert sees a lot when they first look at a problem and a beginner maybe doesn't see as much or just gets overwhelmed, um, you know, how could I have seen more? And then on the sort of the negative side, what was giving me trouble, if anything, even if you got it right, um, was I slow? Was I disorganized? Um, was the question just hard to understand? Were the things that were, were hard to do um, was there something about my process that needs streamlining? Right. And then I think a really important part of review is not just, hey, why is the right answer what it is? And how do you get there? Of course, we're all going to look for that. 
especially if you had trouble understanding the problem. But I really want to think about what I'm going to do next time. Because in the end, you're not going to see this problem on the test, right? Whatever problem you're doing, you're not going to see it on the test. You're going to see something else. So it's sort of saying, what would I do in the future that would cause this to go differently? Right. Think about how you do this in like interpersonal terms, right? Maybe I say something that really offends someone or upsets them and I realize I did the wrong thing, but it's very specific. I didn't realize that this person would be bothered by some very specific thing I said or did. So I could say, hey, don't do that again. You know, don't do that one thing again. But more broadly, it might be, what do I need to do as a person to notice when I might be doing something that makes someone uncomfortable and stop it <laughs> much sooner, right? And so it's that kind of thinking when we apply to the test. Um, what do I need to do about my organization of my page, uh, my upfront approach? Um, are there habits I need? Are there little quick checks I need to make, right? For instance, um, maybe, you, uh, maybe you forget uh, about positive versus negative solutions, right? And so you have to think about, okay, is this a situation where there's going to be more than one answer or not, right? So when you see, you know, an X squared, uh, maybe it's clear to you that, you know, hey, when if X squared is 16, uh, then X is plus or minus four. But are you checking in other situations where there might be more than one solution and saying, hey, do I recognize that that could be happening, like with say an absolute value or something else? Okay. Um, having said all that, uh, ask me any questions that you want before we start, but then we're going to jump into some time sets and we'll try putting some of this uh, process together. Um, I'll apologize in advance. The, uh, the problems can be kind of small and I know some people have griped about, hey, you know, these, these problems are, are a little hard to see. I hope you have enough screen space to see them. Um, I'll be showing them individually um, afterwards and then, you know, they'll look a little bit bigger, but I'm kind of cramming onto the page. That's another reason I'm only doing problem sets of three today because um, realistically, um, it's, it's kind of hard to do any, any more than that and throw them onto a screen for you. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, let me start with a set of, uh, I'll do this one. So I'm going to start with a set that has, um, one quantitative comparison and uh, two regular uh, regular problems. Um, so uh, for those who haven't done much quantitative comparison, the answers uh, for this one just are A, B, C, D, right? A, A says A is always bigger or greater if you want to be more precise. B says B always greater, right? C says equal and D says that it varies that we can't tell. Right, so that's that's the answers we're dealing with on this. So I'm going to give you five minutes and twenty seconds to do this set. Um, if you're uh, if you want to have your own timer, um, then go for it. I do tend to recommend that you stay away from your phone when you're doing practice. Um, ideally, don't even have your phone in the room with you because it's such a distraction. And so I know, you know, we all have timers on our phones, but sometimes it's helpful to do it on a computer or even have an old school timer or a watch or something like that, just so we're not. Um, you know, constantly getting pulled away and getting that brain drain of the phone. So maybe I'm talking like a grandpa, but I have to do it myself uh, because, you know, actually grandpas are the most susceptible to, uh, you know, technology <laughs> distraction in some cases. Maybe you know what I mean. Um, but uh, however you want to do it, if you want to time on your own, you can. And if you're, you know, watching this recording later um, and you want to have uh, your own running time, you can. But I'll stop you all in, in 520. Make sure you're thinking about uh, decision making. Am I Am I starting my process right? Am I finding ways to narrow down? Am I looking for alternatives? Um, am I choosing which ones I really want to spend time on? As you know, on the GRE, probably you can cycle back around. So if you guess on, you know, say the second one, but then you want to come back around to it, uh, then you can do that as much as you want within the five minutes and 20 seconds. All right, so I'll stop talking and I'll let you try these and I'll check with you in 520. Here we go.
All right. How'd we do? That set survivable? Let's see what we got out of these. Um, one thing that can be really interesting uh, from the review perspective is just to look at each one and sort of say, what thoughts might I have at the beginning of this problem? Um, so I'll come back to the one at the top, but um, the one at the bottom left the, with the inequality, um, any initial thoughts I might have on what I should expect from an answer when I see an absolute value combined with an inequality of greater than or equal to? What should I expect to happen with my answer? Yeah, I could see calling it a trick question, or you could just say that's what you would expect, right? Uh, you expect two answers. Just like with x squared is 16, um, you expect two different answers because it's an absolute value. If I just tell you x is greater than blah, 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 then there's probably only one way to run that. But when I say x squared is greater or some absolute value is greater, um, then I can expect two answers. And so check it out. I can immediately say, OK, these are all out. Now I can look at the other two answers, of course, and I can do the work. Uh, a couple of things you might notice that they have the exact same values. So check it out. I don't need to find the values. Right? They've been found for me. Apparently, the limits in this problem are 5 and negative 19 fifths. OK, that negative 19 fifths doesn't look that fun to find, so I'm glad they did it for me. Right? And honestly, even when you look at the other choices, they're all that. So you could do all the work to get the negative 19 fifths. I've done it. It's not that terrible. Um, but you don't necessarily need to. What you need to know is, if I have an absolute value greater than something, am I going to have a range tied in the middle? Or am I going to have a divergence? Am I going to have? Uh, a disjunction where it goes off to infinity from the, toward the positive and the negative sides. So is it going to be constrained in or is it going to be expanding out? So what do you think? Which one should it be? Should I have it expanding out in both directions like in D or should I have it constrained in like in E? Thoughts? One way I might test that is, uh, OK, I'm seeing a vote for D. Yeah, one way I might test that is using something simpler, right? Think about if I just have absolute value of x is, uh, also use a different variable, absolute value of z is greater than 10, right? Well, you know that if z is positive, then absolute value doesn't do anything. So z would just be greater than 10. But if absolute value is negative, then it goes the opposite. And one way to do that is to flip the sign and negate the whole right side. So z is less than negative 10. But the idea of it is you could test numbers. You could say, well, z can't be 0, because absolute value of 0 is just 0. That's not greater than 10. 0 can, can't be like 2, or it can't be negative 2, because that would give you the same thing. And so another way to think about this is when you have a simple variable like z, you'll just say, hey, if I put in 2 or negative 2, I'll just get 2. If I put in 5 or negative 5, I'll just get 5, right? So I won't say more than 10. I either have to have past 10 on the positive side or past 10 on the negative side. So what you can say is that when you have greater than, expect a disjunction. And all I mean by a disjunction is they're going off in two different directions. And the beautiful thing there now is that I can do this problem without doing this problem, if, if you get what I'm saying, right? I, I didn't do the algebra. I can show you how to do the algebra, but I didn't need to do it here. And so sometimes our expectations are enough to actually get us to an answer, right? Usually they're not, honestly. I wish I could say I just, you know, snap through the GRE like that. I wish. Um, but some of the time they are. And that's cool when it happens. Uh, what about the bottom right here, the, the triangle? I don't think it's as clearly obvious what to expect from an answer. Maybe to you it is. Uh, but you, know, you kind of look at these numbers and you say, well, they're not that far apart. They're asking for AC. Uh, so one thing I might want to do is have some way of marking what it is that I want. So I might write AC equals on my paper. I can't actually mark with red like this the way I'm doing, right? But but noticing it, or if I draw it, marking it more clearly. Um, and so I might write AC equals or, you know, base equals or something like that. Um, base can be any side, but if I think of it as the bottom, you know, that, that might be another way of seeing it, right? Just translating it to what I want. Um, so I might, I might have some expectations there. Um, and I might think about, hey, what do I know about how sides relate? It's a right triangle. So maybe I'm recognizing that, hey, this is going to test Pythagorean theorem. Uh, but if I have been studying for a while, I might also remember that there are special triangles. And all I mean by special triangles is there are patterns that are easy to memorize. And so they expect you to memorize them. And uh, 
And so very commonly, I just basically walk in with a little bit of, if you can call it privilege or entitlement, I just assume it's going to be an easy special triangle and that I'm not going to have to work that hard. And I'm usually right. I usually don't have to work that hard. I usually don't have to do a lot of calculation of A squared plus B squared to C squared. So kind of look for that and expect that. Um, that doesn't necessarily tell you the answer, but it might give you some hints. Okay. Um, then what about the one on the top, the, the quantitative comparison? If you're used to these, you might be used to the idea that you test cases, um, that you'll say, hey, what if X is five and Y is four? Or what if X is 20 and Y is three? Or hey, they could be negative. What if X is negative five and Y is uh, negative 10, right? Um, but you might test different cases and see what happens. But you might think about, is this one where different cases might give a different answer, right? I might get something like D. Or is it the kind of thing where there's going to be one distinct answer? And with all these variables, I think you'd figure that it at least could vary, that it might be D. It's probably not the case that, um, or at least it's not immediately obvious that it's the case that one of these uh, has to have a very clear answer, like a number, like, oh, this is going to be 10. Right? Um, so I would want to test a few cases and find out. All right. So let's run through and, and, and do a bit more with these individually. Um, so... On the bottom left one, I just want to show really quickly uh, what you want to get used to modeling, right? The two cases for uh, absolute value. We already solved this one, right? But when you review, you don't just want to see how you got this one. You want to make sure you're feeling good in general. So the idea would be the positive or zero case. Uh, absolute value doesn't do anything. And so you just write it as 3x plus 7 is greater than or equal to 2x plus 12. I'll, I'll just have greater than for now. And then the negative case, it's flipped. So you'd say... And this is just so that you can memorize. 3x plus 7 is less than or equal to negative 2x minus 12. Um, and so when you do it that way, da, 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 throw in my or equal to. You already know I'm going to have a greater than or less than case, so you're kind of done. Um, but if you wanted to solve, you'd subtract 2x from both sides, and you subtract 7 from both sides, and you get this. Um, one thing you can anticipate is that the numbers will be different. And you can see that in the answers, that the numbers are different, five in the negative 19 fifths. Um, but that also, when you have something added or subtracted inside the absolute value, it's gonna have a disproportionate effect. It's gonna sort of move things over from being centered. And so if you have it centered, like Z is greater, absolute value of Z is greater than 10, then Z is gonna be more than 10 or less than negative 10, it's symmetrical. But when you have something added inside, it shifts it over by that many units. And so these things are, are, you know, are shifted over. Here it's a little tricky because of all the extra apparatus in here to see that, but, but that's the, the, you know, the basic idea is that this is shifted over from being centered. Um, and so if you move this over, you're gonna have 5x is less than or equal to negative 19. And if you make a mistake, as actually I think I did when I was solving this uh, before, um, I accidentally, uh, I don't know, I think I, messed up the signs and, and got a five on this one as well. But I caught that mistake and I catch a lot of my mistakes. I make plenty of mistakes, but I catch a lot of them because I went, wait a second, I'm getting the same number that I got before. That's a sign that I did something wrong because I shouldn't be getting the same number as before. Uh, and so then you have that. And so that's how you could, you know, solve it very outright. But again, we already solved this one. And so uh, if you can get there without having to do all that, then great, you save yourself the trouble, but now you have the strength for another time. And this again, depends on what you're reviewing for. If you're taking the DRE in like three days and you already know how to do this stuff and you're just trying to like make sure that things went well, you know, you might not spend the time to run through all the cases of this. If you're trying to really learn absolute value and inequalities, then you might spend time running through it and varying it and doing some extra examples to make sure that you, you know, recognize it when you see it and you have the speed and the skill. Okay. Um, so let's return to the, uh, the quant comp version. Um, so here they're telling us X is greater than Y. Um, so I can definitely test some cases, right? Um, did anyone try this? Anyone put some numbers in? Okay, so I could just try X is two, Y is one, yeah. Keep it simple. If I'm gonna have to square stuff, I might not wanna make it big. Now I wanna be aware that one is a weird number. That's not bad, it's not good or bad, it just is weird, right? So that when I square one, nothing happens. When I divide by one, nothing happens. Um, and that's gonna affect the kind of answer I get. And I might expect that I might get a different answer when Y is not one, or I might not, right? Maybe I keep getting the same answer, but I, at least there's a possibility that, that something like that will happen. 
Um, so I'll write down my A, B, C, D, E. And here's a beautiful thing. If you don't already know this, then then hopefully you're getting your your free money's worth out of this uh, from this this idea alone. Every time you test a case on on quantitative comparison, um, every time you do that, you can get rid of two of the four choices. You get rid of the two that don't fit the result you got. Right. Another way of saying that is whatever you get, whether you get A is bigger or B is bigger or they're equal, it's always either it's always going to be that, in which case you choose that one, or it isn't always that, in which case you choose D. But it can't always be the ones you didn't get this time. Right. I can't always win a race if I lost this one. So I can test this. Okay, x squared is four over one plus one over y. The beautiful thing about that is that I know how to do one over one very easily, All right? So that's four over two is two. Okay, and then here I'm gonna have y squared one over two plus one over two. That's a little more involved, but hopefully not uh, too wild. Notice that I don't actually care what this is. If you say, hey, one divided by two and a half, well, that's less than one. So two is more than one. So this one wins. So what do I say? I say, well, either it's always A or it's D. So as soon as you get a single result, then you can cross out the other two. Um, so I saw one of you suggesting you know, that we play with a negative number. I could certainly try to just see what happens when I make X bigger. Like what if X is 10 instead of two and I keep Y as one? Or maybe if I make them one apart still, but, but larger. But I wanna try some variety. So I think testing some, um, some negative cases uh, is often a smart idea. So I saw a suggestion of X is negative five and Y is negative 10. Okay, let's do it. Okay, it's good that numbers are gonna be a little uglier, but we can handle it. Negative five squared is 25. And then I'm gonna have negative 10 plus one over negative 10. So what is that? That's going to be 25 over negative 10.1. Right. And I'll see if I need to fine tune this more. Right. But I can see this is about negative two, a little over negative two. Right. And then when I flip that, I have, okay, negative 10 squared is 100. And then I've got divided by negative five plus negative five, negative one over negative five, which I could also just call negative one fifth. Uh, so this is 100 divided by negative 5.2, you could call that. So this one is more like negative 20. So which one wins? Negative two is still more than negative 20. So that reinforces my idea of A. Now, this is uh, a sneaky situation, right? Because how long have I been working on this? If I've been working on it a long time on the test, I might have to just say, you know what? A is what I'm seeing right now. So uh, I'm going to pick A. And, you know, maybe, you know, maybe that's wrong. But, you know, what else, what else can I do? However, um, if I have more time, I might I might still actively look for more numbers. But that's a tricky situation. If I find two cases, then I know it's D and I can move on. And if I find um, and if I find some principle to prove that say A is larger, then cool, I can pick that A is larger and move on. But if I just try a couple cases and I've kind of worked pretty hard at it, and A is bigger both times, then it has to be a judgment call. Is there likely to be a way to shake this loose, or is this not? So any thoughts on that? Is there a reason to, at this point, stick with A and get out of here or to move on?
yeah, I might move on just to save time. Right. Um, if I if I didn't want to move on, one thing I might do is try to match the the quantities I had, but switch the sign. So let me show you something cute. Notice how we did two and one, but two is bigger, right? I mean, two is bigger than one, x is two and y is one, but we have certain quantities. What would happen if instead of picking negative five and negative 10, I pick two and one again, but I just switch the signs. So at that point, which one would be, which one would be two and which one would be one? We'd have x is, I need x is negative one and y is negative two. The beautiful thing is that then I could figure out these things, uh, but they'd have switched value, right? Um, so what would, uh, what would quantity A be equal to? Notice that I can basically just say all the values are the same, but they're, they've switched place, right? So the y's are twos and the x's are ones. But also because I've squared on the top and I haven't squared on the bottom, it'll be negative. So you can prove this later to yourself, but basically this one will be negative two and this one will be negative one over 2.5. So my cute idea doesn't play out still because this is still bigger, right? It's a smaller negative. One more trick up my sleeve. Um, and honestly, this is the kind of thing you might look at later and just say, hey, why should I have ever tried this, right? What if I keep x as two and just change the sign of y? Now look what happens. I keep the same value as from before, but the just the sign switches. But the positions don't switch. In other words, I'll, I'll write this one out. If x is two, I still have this. And then I have negative one plus one over negative one. I get negative two. And here I get one over negative two plus one over negative two. So now I get one over negative 2.5, right? Um, and so basically if you, if you want, that's, you know, that's negative 0.4. So believe it or not, the answer is D um, because this one can win. So you might say, okay, great. So if I think of X is two and Y is negative one, then I get this right. And if I don't think of this, I get penalized, right? Um, and you can think of it that way, but I'll tell you something interesting, right? Um, I got this one in, in this kind of way, but I didn't try these numbers. And so one thing that you can, you can ask yourself in a question is, is there any way to see this without doing all the work? And often there is. And so, and I try to find these things. I actively look for these things. Sometimes I even imagine there's some kind of like, I don't know whether it's just like the smartest person in the world or like some alien that's smarter than anyone in the world, but just like someone who's like super, 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 super advanced, would there be a way to see this really fast? <laughs> and then I try to look for that way and say, is there a way I can see it really fast, even though I'm not, you know, the greatest genius in history or anything like that, right? Not required for this test, thankfully. Um, they got to fill those grad schools. We can't all be the greatest genius in history. Um, I look back and say, is there is there just a way to see this? And what I might notice is that the values of x and y um, are going to create you know uh, consistent relationships. And what I mean by that is, okay, if x is bigger than the top of the left, will be bigger than the top of the right. And if y is smaller, then the the bottom on the left will be uh, smaller than the bottom on the right. And so I'm basically saying, it seems like I'm doing bigger divided by smaller, no matter what, right? Whereas here, this is the smaller of the two and the bigger of the two. And if you do, if you take a big number and divide it by a smaller number, that's going to be a bigger result usually than smaller and bigger. But what this ignores is sign. 
And so what I'd actively do here is say, okay, so I can see A is bigger, but in which direction? If I just flip the sign, the answer reverses. A really, a really, you know, much nicer, easier version of that would be something like, hey, what's bigger? Uh, you know, I don't know, like uh, x or y, when you when they've told you that x squared is greater than y squared. And then you say, okay, well, normally I expect that to mean x is um, a larger number. But of course, first off, I don't know whether maybe x is negative and y is positive. But maybe they tell me something else. Maybe they tell me they're the same sign. But even then, I don't know, is x a larger positive number or a larger negative number? Which way does it go? And, and recognizing that even if they're the same sign, I could have something like 5 and 4, where x wins, or negative 5 and negative 4, where x loses. If I recognize that those can flip, then I can go straight to d. And that's what we have here. We have a situation where they can flip. If I have the exact same values, but I just change uh, y to be negative, these values flip, and I get the opposite of what I got before. OK, I had a question in the chat about, you know, what is what always true? So I, I, I think I missed it when it first came through. So what were you asking is what always true? OK, well, here, then I'll throw us the other one. And then we'll uh, get to the other, uh, the next set. Um, if you flip one of those signs, you can flip the value. Uh, well, it depends on on the situation that you have, for sure. Um, but but in general, if you have something, if you have something, the reason it's it works here, right? I should say there's very few things that are always true unless they are actual rules. Um, what we have here is that the top is positive no matter what, right? X squared and Y squared. Um, actually, uh, we know because we know they're not zero. Um, so it can't be zero. So the top is always positive. And so the sign depends on the thing on the bottom. So uh, I can't make uh, x, well, I can't make x negative without making y negative, right? Um, but uh, but here I can I can uh, change my run. And actually, uh, oh, I think I misspoke earlier. I think you do need to make, um, Oh yeah, well, oh yeah, I misspoke earlier because it wouldn't even be that this would be, um, that's funny, I actually messed it up a little bit. Um, it wouldn't even be that this one is um, a larger negative, it would be that this is negative two and this would actually pop, be positive. If x is, uh, if x is two, this is gonna be one over uh, 2.5, it's gonna be positive. So I misspoke earlier or, or was wrong earlier, interesting. And I think it's 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 fun to see uh, the stuff I mess up, and you can do that stuff and still end up, you know, getting a very nice score if you're finding ways to catch a lot of your your mistakes. Um, and also if you have principles that help you, right? So actually, it didn't flip the sign here um, because y sign uh, didn't make this one negative. Yeah. So, but this one wins even more then, right? Okay. Cool. Uh, all right. One more in this set, and then we'll get to the next set. Um, so this one uh, is maybe less obvious. So I look for other things I could do. Uh, I did a, a workshop, uh, I think last month on working backwards. And I think one thing you can do here is just start with B and see what happens. Um, and so you can just say, all right, uh, what if X plus two is 10, right? And you could redraw this on your paper. Now, uh, why B? Because you could also start with D, but the idea is that you can then maybe pin the answer. If B is too big, then it's A. Right, and if B is too small, then you could test D and, and test from there. So it gives you some flexibility. Sometimes you can't tell whether it's too big or too small, and then you test B and D and see which way the answer is trending. Are they getting closer? Or are they getting further? Right. So if X plus two is ten, that would make X eight, in this case. Right. Um, and so then I'd say, okay, so this would be um, seven. Right. And this would be uh, 13. Now, how do I tell if that could be right? How do I know if 7, 10, 13 works? I can do my good old Pythagorean theorem. Hey, is 7 squared plus 10 squared equal to 13 squared? Now, this is hard if that 
is feeling slow, that could take up a lot of your time. So you have to think about it, right? Um, but the 10 squared is not bad. And hopefully seven squared is something you have memorized. You might not have 13 squared memorized. If you do, then you could say, hey, that doesn't look right. right? Um, the trick is though, I don't necessarily know whether to go larger or smaller. Um, so here's where, um, well, talk about that in a minute. Um, but you might say, well, let's see, when, when I have x be uh, 10, right, the, the difference becomes larger on the right. In other words, that the hypotenuse is winning, right? So the, you know, 13 is too big to fit these. Um, and what I'm going to do is if I make x larger, that plus 5 will matter less. And this is something you can get really into with working backwards. Um, it's a it's a general principle that you can rely on that when you have numbers getting bigger, the fixed differences between them matter less, right? If you're making $4 an hour and someone else is making five, oh my gosh, it's such a big difference. They're making 25% more than you. If you're making $400 an hour and someone else is making 501, then it's a quarter of a percent that they're making more than you. It just doesn't matter as much. Same thing with like age differences. When we're young, someone who's a few years younger and older, older than us seems vastly different in age. You know, when you're in your 40s, 50s, 80s, a, a couple of years doesn't really matter much, right? And so um, as we go up, we can find that that difference goes away a little bit. So if I try 13, um, I, rather than write the numbers all out again, I can just increase everything uh, by three. So I'd say, hey, that would be 10 squared plus 13 squared. Uh, does that equal 16 squared? You might not know 16 squared off the top of your head. You can definitely use a calculator. Uh, and this is a question too. Um, you can also do doubles. 16 is 2, 4, 8, 16. So you can just double 16 four times. 32, 64, 128, 256. Now look what happened. 269 is more than the right-hand side. It flipped. You know what that means? The answer is C. Another way I might be tempted to choose C, in fact, another reason I might start with something like C is because I recognize that 12 often appears in special triangles. There's like 5, 12, 13, but there's also like 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 9, 12, 15, right? So that's a, that's a 12 is a number that appears in some of my special triangle patterns. And when I saw this, I came to this with a bit of that entitlement and said, hey, I bet it's like a special triangle, but these are three apart, right? So if I get used to my three, four, five triangle, in a three, four, five triangle, the, the legs are just one apart, right? In a six, eight, 10 triangle, which is just double, the legs are two apart, but check it out in a 9, 12, 15 triangle, they're three apart. And so I might expect that this is the 12, and then this would be 9. Hey, that fits. If x is if this is 12, x is 10, this would be 9, and then this would be uh, 15. So that's another way to get there. OK, thoughts on that? Okay, um, let me adjust slightly just in the interest of time. I am going to give you two more. And what I want you to think about as you do these is how do I eliminate some answers, even if I don't feel great doing the whole thing? So I'm going to give you four minutes to try these two, uh, and then we'll review afterwards. So here we go, four minutes.
So how are these? Survivable? That's my favorite word today, apparently. Um, see what we're doing with them. I uh, sometimes will uh, start my review by looking at, is there a way I could have narrowed down some answer choices uh, in a way that I didn't already do? Or did I do that correctly? Um, sometimes we're wrong. And, and if we're in a real hurry, like I might ask what I would do if I had 30 seconds on one of these problems. Um, sometimes I might actually put myself in a bad situation because I might quickly eliminate um, answers in, in an incorrect way. Um, so I do want to at least make sure that the logic is, is making sense, even if I have to move pretty quickly. So for instance, someone might say, oh, she spent a total of 84. I want to know the price of the jeans. Well, clearly it has to be less than 84. So I'll cross all these out. That would be wrong, right? Um, why? The jeans are pretty heavily discounted. They're 70% off. So um, sure, she she spent less than $84 on the jeans, but the original price could have been quite a bit more, right? So we got to watch what, what we're being asked for. So then I might expect the, whoops, uh, then I might expect the uh, price to be much, uh, much higher. We can talk about narrowing that down a little bit more. If I were going to work backwards on one of these problems, which one do you think would be easier to work backwards on? Uh, this one or the bottom one? Yeah, I'd be tempted to work backwards on the on the top one, basically because this is asking for a single quantity, an original price that I can then discount and add with. So what, if I plug in 96 for the answer, I can just see if that's too big or too small. Um, for the bottom one, they're asking me for a total. And I don't know uh, how that breaks down to the individual pieces, so it'd be hard to test. If I decide that the total is 552, um, I'd have to think about what does that mean uh, their their remaining bill is. I could do it though, because I could say, all right, if five is used the total and two of the bills were 412, then the other one's 140. And I could see if that gives me the average I want. So actually I, I, I could in theory do it in both. I just have to be a little, it's a little less obvious how to start on 19. Um, I might also think about extent. Uh, for instance, here I might say, oh, okay, well, if she spent more on the blouse than the jeans then she spent like probably looks like less than 40 on the jeans but they were discounted by 70 percent. so she paid a third so she spent you know she spent you know maybe a less than 40 dollars but the you know, original was about three times as much so somewhere around so maybe less than 120, but maybe it's not less. Maybe it's exactly 120, but it's in that in that range, right? So maybe D or E would be a guess, right? I could be wrong. Um, and then here I might say, okay, the largest and smallest bills were 412, but the median was less than the average. Um, and so I figure, okay, the median has to be less than 200. Uh, because the average of the other two is about 200. So total is less than 612. And I might get rid of, uh, I might get rid of these and I might even be tempted to get rid of this. Um, a might look a little small. Uh, that's just taking the actual number 44 and adding it to this. That seems unlikely. That seems like a trap. So I'd be tempted to choose B, although I might want to prove it. Okay, so let's see if we can do some proving real quick and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I keep putting that weather one back in. Um, so one way we could do this one, as we said, was to work backwards. And I think that's probably the easiest way to do the problem, honestly, rather than creating variables. I love algebra, but I do it when I need to, not just all the time. And so I could just say, hmm, normally I'd want to start with B, but here I'd tempted to start with C or D because it's just easier to take percents off of something like 100. Um, so I might just start with, with C. I could say, all right, well, let's see 70% off that the jeans would be, uh, you know, $30. And then the blouse would be 12 more. That's 42. Notice I don't care that the blouse is 40% off because they never talk about the original price. Um, so I don't actually care. So 72, hey, that's too small. That means all of these are too small. So I just test one of these other ones, whichever one's easier. And whatever is not right, it's the other one. So then I could do, okay, 70% off of 120. Some people do 120 minus 0.7 of 120, 
but I think that's a waste of time on a calculator because then I have to find what 0.7 of 120 is and uh, and then remember it and then subtract it. So think of it always as the remaining percent, 30% of 120. And just all, anytime you're going to punch a percent off or, or increase on a calculator, do it that way. 70% off means multiply by 0.3. 70% increase means multiply by 1.7. 30, you know, 40% uh, off means multiply by 0.6. 40% increase means multiply by 1.4. So you can get in the habit of doing that. So, hey, that's $36. Um, so then we'd hey, say, hey, 36 plus I, I want 12 more. 48, hey, that's looking good. Done. Okay. Whereas this one, I, I, I have a feeling uh, I've got the answer already with B. But I might draw it out. And here's one where it could be really useful to organize because there's two things going on. I've got three bills. Ah, I've got three bills to figure out. Um, but also, I need to know um, the total, right? So all these together equal some total. So I know that, let's see. Um, I might just want to test B now, actually. I might say, hey, if, if B is true, then 552 minus 412, what's left? 140. So let's see what happens if I put 140 in here. And then these two together, I don't really care which one's which, are 412. Uh, then if I say, hey, 552 divided by 3, is that 44 more than that than what I have? So let's see, 552 divided by three is, uh, what is that, uh, 184? Check it out, 184 minus 40 is 144. It works out. So I'm, I'm doing this kind of minimally on the screen and you might organize that more on your paper and that would be something you'd look at. Does that leave me feeling very, like much like I'm hanging? Um, do I need to just do it algebraically? And, you know, honestly, on the test, I might do it this way. I might just do the algebra. I might just say, hey, I know I have some number, let's say X that I call the median. And I know that these two together add up to 412. So I know that the total equals 412 plus X. But I also know that the average divided by three, right? The total divided by three is equal to the median plus 44. So I might, instead of trying to divide 412 by three, I don't feel like it. I'll just move that three over to the other side and say, hey, 412 plus x equals 3x plus 132. It's a little easier for me to work with. And then I would just subtract. Right? Um, so I'd say, hey, 280 is 2x and 140 is x. Nothing wrong with a little algebra, and maybe this is very comfortable for you. Um, I just have to then remember to say, OK, what is it that I want? I want 412 plus x, but if I've written it down, and I have it. Okay. But having some expectations, I think, is really important. Um, they may not be perfect expectations. They could even be wrong expectations. And then, you know, good thing I didn't end up guessing. I finished solving. But that way, that's what I have in place. Even if I end up being wrong, at least I'm, I'm doing my best to narrow things down and see what makes sense. And there's a lot that you can gain from that. And so part of your speed strategy is really knowing when to get out of there, knowing when um, to settle for good enough. Hey, I tested several cases and uh, I kept getting the same result and I moved on. Maybe on that first one, we did the quant comp. Maybe you tested a few different numbers and got A. Or maybe like me, <laughs> you made a mistake uh, that led to trouble. Although it, you know, it turns out my mistake didn't punish me, but some of them do, right? Maybe maybe you did something wrong. I, I, I talk to you know students all the time who say, I tested cases and I got two different uh, you know results. A is bigger and B is bigger. And I say, hmm, well, but A is always bigger. So something went wrong with your case testing. And, you know, that's certainly a, a danger that, that shows up when we're testing cases. So we look back and review for, you know, do I need to strengthen just by, you know, uh, 
organization and application of the numbers, right? Do I need to slow down on that part? Is there a way to suspect that the answers are going to go another way? Um, it's also like, what are they likely to be testing? We saw with with uh, that one, the quant comp, and also with the inequality one, that there was a big element of, of testing positive and negative and recognizing that there's going to be multiple cases that are going to flip things around. And so looking for those things makes a big difference too. All right. So I hope this is a good just uh, check in on the idea of creating mixed sets or, or, or practice sets in general, whether they're mixed or targeted. Um, and I hope you continue to make this part of your of your work, whether you're doing things you've seen before and you want to practice putting them together, whether you're we're trying to push the challenge, but no one to let go. Maybe you do some really hard problems um, and you practice say, hey, I'm going to do five hard problems. I'm going to give myself 10 minutes or whatever it is, but I'm going to expect to let at least one of them go. And on others, I might just narrow it down. And maybe my goal is to say, get three out of those five. You know, on standard A3 multiple choice, you get one out of five for free, right? On average, if you guess on five A3 multiple choice questions, you get one right. Uh, if you, you know a little bit of what you're doing, then you might expect to get at least two. So three is, is a nice solid success, even when the questions are pretty hard. Okay, uh, stick around if you have uh, questions, but we also, you know, invite everyone to uh, check out a, a, a free trial session of one of our classes. Um, you can always visit class one uh, of any of our classes, whether it is uh, GMAT or GRE, uh, and see what we're about, see if you like it before you uh, sign up. So check us out. Um, other than that, I uh, hope uh, everyone has a uh, lovely week, and uh, I'll shut things down in a minute and then answer individual questions if anyone has them. Okay. Thanks, everybody.